Scripture this morning is from John 20. So if you have your Bibles, you can follow along. And if you don't have a Bible and you want a physical one, you could raise your hand. Don't be ashamed. I feel like people are always shy to raise their hands in crowds. It's all good. If you want a physical Bible, raise your hand. And one of our ushers, our amazing ushers, will bring you a Bible. So uh, today's scripture is John 20, 24 to 31. Uh, Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands, reach out your hand, put it to my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Ryan, and a happy Father's Day to those, those dads among us. Um, hey, I know we've been clapping a lot, but we've got to do one more round of applause for all the volunteers at Kids Camp this week. Thank you, guys. During the slideshow, I leaned over to one of our, our leaders. I said, you know, for every three pictures of kids l- smiling and laughing, we should have a picture of a volunteer just like, oh. <laughs> and then she said, well, we took pictures early in the week to prevent that. It's like... Hey, you guys were such a gift to be out there. We had some 40, 50 volunteers out there, 90 kids, 10 faith responses. God is good. If you're here with us, your child uh, attended the camp and now you're checking out Current, we love that you're here. We hope that you can find a home with us as a church. We're excited that you could join us today. Uh, Baptisms, kids camp celebration, Father's Day, and donuts doesn't get better than today. And, you know, as far as the series goes... Today we get to the climax of the book of John. It's just exciting. You know, we're hitting all of it today. But today's scripture is the climax of the book of John. And the book of John is one of the gospel accounts. So it's like, a, it's like a pinnacle piece of the scriptures. Because here in this text, John says, here's the reason I've been writing all of this. Like, here's why I put pen to paper. Now, we're going to have one more sermon in the series, John chapter 21. There's one more chapter we'll look at, but those are mop-up stories, okay? Those are resolving things that were brought up earlier in the text that we have to resolve. But today is the climax of it all. We get to the crux of all of it where, G- where John says, here's what it's been about. You can believe in Jesus as Messiah and as the Son of God, and in believing in him, you can have life forever. And the best part about this story is that we get to this pinnacle through Thomas and his doubts. It's an incredible thought. I mean, how does John build to this culmination of of the text and where he's been going, but through Thomas and his confusion and his doubts? Therefore, we have a text in front of us that's good news for Christians that wrestle with doubts. We have good news for Christians who who wrestle with confusion. So let me pray and then we'll, we'll jump in. Father, thank you for this wonderful text in front of us. We pray, as ever, that you'd give us your spirit to understand it, to apply it to our lives. And Father, we also want to say thank you for all the wonderful things you did uh, through the the team's uh, efforts this week, their work with the kids camp and the kids that responded and got to learn about you. We pray for uh, roots of faith to go down deep for them. And um, and we thank you for each of these volunteer leads that uh, gave, gave some of their precious summer time to this. Would you bless them, help them recover and get energy, but, but most of all, just, uh, just bask in the goodness of, of the clear fruit of what you're doing. Father, I also want to say thank you for the wonderful fathers in our midst and all the wonderful fathers represented uh, in this room today. Uh, would you bless them, watch over them? And then, Father, I also want to pray for those for whom Father's Day is perhaps a little bit harder of a day. It's a challenge. It brings with it uh, perhaps a pain. Would you especially minister to them? But Father, if anything, today is a day as followers of yours, we look to you as our perfect heavenly Father. And so would you minister to each of us today, including through your word now. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. All right. So we pick up today in our account on, the, on Easter night. 
Okay, if you've been tracking through the series, we've been working through the book of John. I kind of cheated and looked at the Easter account early at Easter, and now we're kind of back, jumping to post-Easter. Today, we're picking up in the story where Jesus shows up on the night of, of Easter, after he's risen again uh, to life. And so we're told, now Thomas, also known as Didymus, which means twin in Greek, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So we're not told why Thomas hadn't been with the other apostles when Jesus showed up earlier to them in that same day. Okay, Thomas was out doing something. We don't know. He wasn't there. But clearly, all the others are abuzz with excitement. Okay, So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. And in fact, the way the Greek is putting it is they were saying this repeatedly. Thomas, we've seen the Lord. We've seen the Lord. And, you know, we'll see here in the text that he's kind of pushing them off. Like, no, I don't buy it. And it's not like the disciples then in that moment were like, all right, we tried. On to talking about the weather or what we're getting for dinner tonight, right? They keep pressing it. Thomas, no, you need to listen to us. We've seen him. He's risen from the grave. But notice Thomas' response. He says, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand to his side, I will not believe. So Thomas is adamant. He's like, I'm not believing unless I see Jesus for myself. Now, if you've been uh, to church for any length of time, chances are you know Thomas gets a bad rap in, you know, in, in the Christian world. We know him as what? Doubting Thomas, right? And he just gets ripped on just all the time. In fact, one commentator that I came across this week, a very famous commentator, a guy named uh, Adam Clark, for what it's worth, described Thomas in this light. He, he said, Thomas is unreasonable, obstinate, prejudiced, presumptuous, and insolent. In other words, this famous commentator is like, Thomas is a loser. Like, he's an idiot. He didn't get it. And like, how could this guy be in the scripture kind of deal? But before we give Thomas too bad of a rap, I think we need to acknowledge or remember how the other apostles responded when they heard, first heard about Jesus. Because if you know the story, they didn't respond all that great themselves. So on the day of Easter, the first day when Jesus came back to life, he first showed up to some of the women, including, including Mary Magdalene. And he said to them, hey, I want you to go back and tell the guys. Go tell the apostles that I'm, that I'm here. I'll, I'll, I'll visit them later. So the women run back and, and tell the apostles. And the apostles are immediately like, oh, we already know that. I mean, he hasn't shown up to us, but we knew. He's, he'd been predicting that all the time. You could save what you're sharing because we already know. No. <laughs> that's, that's definitely not what they say. They responded in disbelief, and it's as if Luke, the one who recorded the account, totally busts them out. Listen to this. Luke says, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. That's how the apostles, the other apostles responded to the women when they were telling them that, hey, we've seen the Lord. And then Jesus showed up in that very same chapter right after these events. And he himself called out these other apostles by saying, why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your minds? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. It is I myself touch and see. Does any of that sound familiar? I mean, it's literally the exact same thing Thomas was asking for and wrestling through. And yet Thomas is the one who gets all the shade. Like, I feel kind of bad for Thomas. It's like, we call him Doubting Thomas. There's no place in the Scriptures the Scripture calls him Doubting. But we see Jesus responds to Thomas in essentially the exact same way that he did with the other apostles. Picking back up in verse 26, we're told a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas this time was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then Jesus turned to Thomas and said, come on, my guy, you should know already. No, that's not what he said. Then he said to Thomas, okay, okay, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. If you are the circling type, the highlighting type, the underlining type, I encourage you to do so with the words, my God. because It's a tremendous pinnacle of all the text here. My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So, of course, the key phrase here is my Lord and my God. 
Uh, it's an incredibly important time, not just for Thomas, but really in the gospel account. It's the place where everything clicks for Thomas. Everything clicks really in the gospel of John where Thomas, once and for all, understands fully and completely who Jesus is and what Jesus is all about. And not just that he's Messiah, deliverer, but that he's God, God in the flesh. And as I've been mentioning, John in his account here has been building to this moment. He's been like, this is what it's all been about, that we would understand this. So if you were here with us when we first started this series in John, going all the way back to January, remember that? And we looked at John chapter 1, verse 1. You'll remember that John begins by describing Jesus as the Word and says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. John wasn't trying to mess around at all. He's trying to be really clear. This is God who took on flesh and made his dwelling among us. And then he reiterates this all throughout his gospel account. We've seen many times. So for instance, in John chapter 8, Jesus at one point with the religious leaders said, very truly do I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. And it's like that statement is just profoundly Uh, impactful just in and of itself, let alone what he was referring to in that context, in that time, and in that language. When Jesus called himself, I am, he wasn't just saying, I've always been around without time, although that's incredible. He was also referring to himself with the greatest, holiest name that we have of God in the scriptures. When God showed up to Moses in the burning bush, and Moses asked, who do I say sent me? God gave his full name. He said, I am Yahweh. I am that I am. And when Jesus said before Abraham was born, I am, he was referring to himself as the great I am, as Yahweh. And then John 14, John, John would record Jesus' words saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to me, uh, comes to the Father except through me. So everything has been building to this moment where Thomas says, my Lord and my God. And it's worth noting real quickly as a quick sidebar here, theology, Jesus accepts his worship. Jesus receives his worship. That's profoundly important. I've had any number of people down the years, perhaps you've wrestled with this thought. I'm not sure Jesus claims to be God. Well, we just hit upon a lot of those. But here, in a very profound way, when Thomas declares Jesus as my Lord and my God, this profound declaration, statement of faith, that actually a lot of Bible commentators say is the greatest profession of faith about Jesus anywhere in the scriptures. Jesus doesn't go, no, you can't call me that. No, no, no. Actually, he receives it fully as Thomas is there worshiping him because Jesus all along has been saying, yeah, I am Messiah. I am God in the flesh. Come to be with you. And so John kind of brings everything to a culmination when he finally says in verse 30, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. So he's referring to all the different various miracles that Jesus performed outside of his explicit book in the book of John, which he recorded seven plus the resurrection. And he tells us why he did that. He, did, he, he recorded those seven in particular to show these are miracles that you can't attribute to anyone other than God. He said, but these are written, the ones that I've recorded here, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. In other words, he wanted you and I to understand that Jesus alone is the source of eternal life. But again, here's what's profoundly important about this text. John is building to this incredible statement, this culmination of what he's been saying all along this book's about. And how does he get there? But through Thomas and his doubts. We have good news for Christians who wrestle with doubts. So I want to unpack a few of these and then we'll celebrate baptism. So number one, we see in this text, Jesus meets us in our doubt, okay? To me, this, is, this has got to be the low-hanging fruit, but Jesus meets us in our doubt. We, he, he met the women in their doubt. I didn't really focus in on the details of their story, but when Jesus first shows up to them, they actually struggle with doubt. They don't get their heads fully around who this guy is. They eventually see him as Jesus, understand, receive him. Uh, Jesus met the apostles, the other apostles, in their doubt, as we looked at before. And then, of course, Jesus is meeting here Thomas in his doubt, very intentionally, very purposely, which, of course, has the application of, in our lives, he meets us in our doubt. Now, here's a question we probably are asking. Imagine many of you are asking this right now. Wait a minute, isn't that special treatment for Thomas? I mean, it's kind of nice that he got to see Jesus in the flesh, wouldn't you say? 
that for him, when he was wrestling with his doubt, he got to see Jesus' piercings and put his hand there on his side. Like, isn't that special treatment? And you know what? Answer to that question, it was special treatment. Jesus was very intentionally doing that with Thomas for a good reason and good purpose. What do I mean? Well, something we need to see in this text is Jesus is putting Thomas in a little bit of a double bind. Do you notice that? So when Jesus is interacting with Thomas, there's a little bit of a double bind element going on here. Because on the one hand, he's saying, Thomas, my guy, you shouldn't need to see me. You shouldn't need to see the hand, you know, the markings. You shouldn't need to put your hand in my side. You shouldn't need any of that. On the other hand, Jesus goes on to say, hey, even though you shouldn't need this, I'm going to go ahead and give you what I just told you you don't eat. You know what I mean? Like, that's what's going on in the text. Like, what's going on there? Here's what we see. Thomas, as a believer, Jesus was making it just very clear, had everything that he needed. As a believer, Thomas had everything that he needed. But as an apostle, Jesus is like, okay, I'm going to give you something extra. I'm going to give you special treatment. Because that's what it meant to be an apostle. He was commissioning Thomas in a way. What do I mean? How do I know this? Well, one of the biblical definitions of what it meant to be an apostle was they had to have been present, eyewitness account, uh, eyewitnesses to the risen physical Jesus. Are you tracking? So, for instance, in Acts chapter 1, excuse me, when the apostles go to replace Judas, who, you know, kind of betrayed Jesus, right? They go to replace him. One of the requirements they stipulate, they articulate, is we need to find somebody who was an eyewitness account to the risen Jesus. That's a part of what it meant to be an apostle, okay? And then all throughout uh, Paul's writings, you know, another apostle, he always harkens back to his authority as an apostle. And by the way, as an apostle, was able to write some of the scripture. He always harkens back to the story as possible, linking it directly to what? That he had seen the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus. Like that to him was intricately linked because biblically speaking, that's what it meant to be. That was one of the requirements to be an apostle. Are are we tracking? Why is that? Well, these are the guys who were literally commissioned by the Lord to go out and start the faith. These are the guys that everybody else have to turn to to go, okay, they saw him. We got to take their testimony. And what Jesus was saying to Thomas, as a believer, was, Thomas, you had more than enough to believe. You know what I mean? I mean, that's why he rebukes him and says, stop believing, uh, stop, me, stop doubting and believe. As a believer, he had everything we need. What did he have as a believer? The word of the apostles. The apostles there telling him repeatedly, hey, you got to believe this. It's true. We've seen him. Jesus is like, Thomas, you have enough. But as an apostle, okay. I'm commissioning you. I'm going to set you out. You're going to be one of these guys. So let me show you uh, my side and all all the rest of it. But as a believer, he had all that he had. It's important to understand that Jesus saw that he had more than you. And you know what? We have the same of what Thomas had in a sense. Because all of the scriptures are directly linked to the apostles, the New Testament scriptures. That's why they're in the text, by the way. You see that evidently all the way throughout history, going all the way back. All the earliest of church fathers would always ask the question, if the scripture is, it, what, what's its apostolic authority? Who wrote this? And is, was it one of the, the apostles? Or was it one of the apostles kind of recording his thoughts for it to be, to be said and put to paper? Paul was always hearkening back to that in his text. So for instance, we see in 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul says, hey, this is of first importance. Okay? I always love when the scripture does that. Because the scriptures, all of scripture is important. But then when all of scripture that's important says this is the most important, it's like, okay, I think I can track that. That's important, okay? Paul goes, hey, of all the things, uh, this is of first important. He says that Christ died, that he was buried, that he rose again to life, and that he appeared. And of the people he appeared to, he appeared to these apostles. And it's worth noting that that same letter, 1 Corinthians, is a letter that nobody denies was written by Paul. I mean, even the most secular, skeptical scholars of other scripture texts, they might go, I'm not, we're not so sure if that was scripture or whatever. Uh, I think they all are. But the point is, in 1 Corinthians, there's no dispute over it. Is this making sense? And so Paul, in the time in which, if it's attributed historically, which everybody, nobody doubts, said all these things, hey, this is of first importance, and he appeared to us. He was saying this all at a time when the people around him could have called baloney. You know what I mean? He was writing at a time where everybody had been like, you were claiming to be eyewitness accounts to that resurrection thing? Yeah, you guys are a cuckoo. But we don't have any evidence for that. 
actually, we have a lot of evidence for the Christian faith exploding onto the scene. And how did it explode onto the scene? Through the testimony, eyewitness accounts of the apostles. The apostles going out and saying, he really rose again to life. It's true. We've seen him. Now notice what I did not say how Christianity exploded onto the scene. Christianity did not explode onto the scene by the apostles saying, hey, we found some really good teachings that, is, that are really going to benefit your life. There's a lot of things that will benefit your life in these scriptures. Wonderful. That's not what they said, though. They said, no, you got to believe this because Jesus rose again. We've seen it. We testify to it. We are eyewitnesses for it. And the reason why I stress all of this is, look, God meets us in our doubt in so many ways. It can happen in different forms and, and different experiences. But by far and away, what the Lord gives you and me today to understand who he is, what he's about, and how he meets us, including inner doubts, he's given us his word that he preserved through his apostles. Including helping us understand through stories like these that God doesn't whack us over the head when we have doubts and confusion. But he looks to meet us, care for us, and walk with us in the midst of it. Some of you today, perhaps you're wondering whether or not you're Christian. You know what I mean? Like maybe you're wondering, I think I'm Christian. Or maybe you're wondering, I don't think I'm Christian. I'm still trying to work it out. You've got these doubts that you're working through. And, uh, you know, I could take different forms of doubts. Like, you know, for instance, I always think of my uh, mother-in-law who by education and trade was a scientist. Uh, for her, her biggest doubt was always around the virgin birth. She couldn't believe that anything, you know, the, she, she could, couldn't conceive of herself as a Christian because of the virgin birth. And it was an interesting conversation. She's very smart, but I would ask her things like, well, what about the other miracles like the feeding of the 5,000 or, you know, I just named a couple of these other miracles. She's like, yeah, I have no problem with those. I can, I, I can believe those, no problem. So, oh, but the virgin birth, yeah, I, no, I can't, that's too much doubt there. I can't, you, you tracking? For some of you, maybe there's like a doctrinal statement or theological thought, or maybe there's a, I don't know, Old Testament story where you just can't get your head around, you got some doubt, you got some confusion. But here's what I'd say in the midst of all of that. According to the Lord, through his word, it really comes down to actually just one thing. What do you make of Jesus and his resurrection? What do you make of that? Because if you believe that God sent him into the world, died on the cross for your sins, rose him into life so that you can, by faith, have eternal life with him, that is what it means to be a Christian. Now, that changes everything. It has a lot of implications. But it doesn't mean that as you work through all these doubts or confusions that, well, you're just not a follower. Is this making sense? And I also want to be real clear. If that's you, that doesn't mean that any doubts or confusion that you have is, well, you just need to not think about it or you just need to, like, think that it's unimportant. Those things are very important. You need to work those things throughout. But get clear on what matters most, and that is what the word of the apostles are mostly about, and that's what Jesus came to do and die and be raised again to life for you. That's what it means to put your faith in him. If you want to put your faith in him today, it's receiving what he did on the cross and was raised again to life again on the third day by faith. Some of you, you've been followers of Jesus for a long time. And for you, you'd go, oh, you know what, David, it's not so much that I have theological or doctrinal doubts. Like I've had those in the past or I've worked through them or I'm not really concerned about those things. But, but you know where your doubts and mine arise? It arises when we doubt if God cares or doubt if God will show up, or doubt whether he's working in our life, or, or if he's working in a way that we just aren't experiencing to be what we think he should be doing already. And if you consider that for a moment, you then realize that Thomas actually represents all of us. Because all of us have doubts. It's not just theological doctrine. It's also just going through life and just being like, God, how could you, or where are you, or why not, or... And what we see is the Lord meets us in our doubt. And he does that primarily through helping us understand what the apostles were mainly teaching. The resurrection. What do I mean? Well, it, it's God's stamp of approval to, for promises like, we see in, say, Romans 8, that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. And then later on in that same chapter, it says, if God graciously gave us his son, how will he not also give us all other things? Meaning we could trust him even when we don't, even when we have some doubts. All right, which leads us to the next thought. God meets us in our doubts. But number two, we see that he wants to, in our doubts, move us towards faith. Jesus here wants to move Thomas from doubt 
into faith. That's uh, it's obviously the trajectory. That's obviously the goal. He came to him and he said, hey, put your hands on my side. And he, and he said, stop believing, oh, excuse me, stop doubting and believe. Then in verse 29 we're told, blessed are those who have not seen yet have believed. So again, in this incredible pinnacle culmination, culminating story of like who God is through Jesus, we see it through this story of Thomas doubting. So God is not looking to whack us on the head or throw us off the team in our doubt. Or worse, he's not going, hey, with your doubts, you just need to pretend they're not there. You know, fake it till you make it. What he's saying is, no, in your doubts, work them through, but his hope, his prayer, his desires for those doubts to move us towards increasingly faith. There are two forms of doubt in the scriptures. There's two forms of biblical doubt uh, that I think are worth kind of mentioning right now. So there, one form of doubt is uh, saying, you know what, I'm not sure how this is going to work out, so I'm going to go ahead and just take things into my own hands. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't, I don't know how this is going to work out, but you know what, God's either sleeping at the clock or he's just not available or whatever. I'm just going to kind of, I'm going to help him out. I'm going to help you out, okay? That's one form of doubt. We can call that closed-minded doubt. The other form of doubt we find in the Bible says, I'm not sure how this is going to work out, but I'm going to do just the best I can trust you anyways. Like, I'm not sure. I, like, I'm not clear. I've got some confusion. I've got some doubts with it, but I'm, going to, I'm just going to, I'm going to believe and trust that you've got this. We can call that open-minded uh, a doubt. And there's actually a wonderful biblical case study for this found in the Christmas story, uh, Luke chapter 1. We see the angel show up to Zechariah, the priest that year, the high priest that year. And uh, Zechariah would go on to become the father of John the Baptist, older cousin by just a few months to Jesus, husband of Elizabeth. And when he went into the Holy of Holies that year behind the curtain, the angel was there waiting for him and just foretold all this would happen. He, Elizabeth's going to be with child, and you're going to name him John. And here's how Zechariah responded to the angel. How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. And at this, the angel was not too pleased. I mean, here's how the angel responded. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and tell you the good news. But because you're not believing right now, I tell you, until this is all fulfilled, you're not going to be able to speak. And then we have recorded the first instance of charades in the scriptures. The Zechariah comes out and is trying to pantomime what just happened. Like an angel. I would love to have been there that day when Zechariah was trying to, without words, explain what had just happened. Zechariah doubted, and it didn't go too well for him. <laughs> okay. Same chapter, same time period, same angel appeared to Mary and said essentially the same thing. Although he said to her, hey, you're going to be with child, and you're going to name him Jesus. And here's how Mary responded. But how will this be? Mary asked, since I am a virgin. The angel answered her, essentially the Holy Spirit would make this possible. And she replied, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. And the angel left her. Like, wait a minute. Didn't Zechariah and Mary essentially respond in the same, with the same question? Right? Wait, how will this be? And then with Zechariah, how can I be sure of this? I mean, it's like, but with Zechariah, nope, no more talking, dude. Mary is like, yeah, you are blessed. Wait a minute. What's going on? Of course, we know what's going on. Zechariah had closed-minded faith. He had this faith of like, I don't see how this is going to work, and yeah, it's not going to work. I'm not sure I'm on this. But with Mary, it's like, I'm not sure this is going to work, but hey, if you're telling me it's going to happen, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go with you, and we'll, we'll see how it plays out. And that's the faith, it seems to me, we see in Thomas on that night of Easter, uh, when he was expressing doubt, the important thing to notice is that in expressing his doubt, in working through his confusion, Thomas had not bailed. He had not left the room, but he was remaining as best he can in the midst of all of it. And we find that there's this beautiful thing about faith that we can just kind of extrapolate. I mean, it seems to me that often in the church, just, you know, church in, in broadly speaking, what we can tend to do is go, you know what, if you have any doubt, or if you have any faith, that just means, well, your faith isn't that strong. You know, what you really need to do is just remove all doubt, remove all confusion, and then your faith won't be puny, and then you'll have faith. But you know what? 
it almost seems to me that sometimes the strongest faith is the one that, even though it has doubts, remains in the Lord. Wouldn't you say? I mean, we all have doubts. We all have confusions at times. And yet, I think what this scripture is telling us is sometimes the strongest of all faiths is the one that's like, you know what, even in spite of my doubts, even in spite of my confusion, even in spite of how things are working out, not working out, or whatever the case may be, I am going to remain. I'm going to remain in the Lord. And so, here's good news for those, for, for Christians who are doubting and wrestling that through. There's a lot of room, biblically speaking, for doubt. There's a lot of room for it. We can say things like, I'm afraid, I'm, you know, I'm, but I'm going to follow Jesus anyways. And there's a lot of room for doubt there. We could say, for instance, in the marketplace, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and choose to do what I know is right, even though I'm pretty darn sure it's going to lead to bad results. But there's a lot of room for doubt there. Or we could say, you know, in my relationships, as I'm seeking to find a special someone that I just long for, and, you know, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to remain faithful to God and his ways, even though it's just like, man, it just doesn't seem like it's, it's, it's going to happen or that the means are possible or the people are available or, or taking this the way I take it. It's like there's a lot of room for doubt there. God meets us in our doubt and he wants to move us in our doubt towards faith. And I would just say, you know, one of the things that really kind of hits me is the fact that it's not so much that the power is in our faith, but the power is in the one whom we place our faith or in what we place our faith. Is this making sense? So for instance... We can have a lot of faith with very little doubt in ineffective medication. You know what I mean? Have great faith, sure it's going to work out, no doubt, in medication that's just not that good. But guess what's going to happen? It's not going to work out that great. Conversely, we can have a lot of doubt, not a whole lot of faith, but just like, ah, I'm going to try in effective medication. Guess what's going to happen? The power is in the one in whom... We place our faith. And that's what Jesus is saying all throughout all the scriptures when he's saying, come to me who are thirsty and I'll give you water that will ne- you'll never thirst again. Come to me who are hungry. I'm the bread of life. He's, and over and over again, he's saying, come to me because I will satisfy you in a way that I and I alone can give you. Will you trust me? And guess what? When you struggle to trust me, will you remain in me? That's the promise. That's the gift. You know, one of my favorite stories in all the scripture, chances are if you've been at Current for any length of time, you know this is one of my favorite stories. But in the, the gospel account of Mark, there was a dad, hey, Father's Day illustration, I didn't realize that. There's a dad who brought his son, who was really sick, just really troubled, uh, to Jesus' disciples such that they might heal, heal the boy. But the disciples couldn't work it out. The apostles were trying all the best they could, praying, doing all the little hand waves they thought Jesus might do or whatever. Couldn't get, it, get him healed. Jesus eventually comes back. <coughs> excuse me. And the guy in his desperation runs to him and says, hey, Jesus, my, you know, your disciples couldn't do this. Can you heal my, my little boy? And Jesus says, everything's possible to the one who believes. And the guy responds, I believe. Help my unbelief. And what I love in that moment is Jesus doesn't go, "Uh uh-uh, you know what? You're going to have to remove more of your doubt before I can work with this. You're going to have to remove more of your confusion and then bring your son back. He doesn't do that. Oh, that's not the Lord. What does he do? At the statement of, I believe, help my unbelief, Jesus says, give me the boy. Heals him. The power of our faith is not so much in the quality of the faith, but in the one in whom we place our faith. And Jesus is inviting you and me that when we doubt or have our confusions or whatever, he doesn't just like come to whack us overhead, but he does want us to move it increasingly from doubt into faith. Why? Brings us to the last thought. Because the ultimate promise of faith is life and life to the fullest. Look, Jesus here is not testing Thomas for the sake of testing him. Nor, does he, nor is he at all interested in doing that for the sake of just giving you a little quiz and being like, this is where... He has great and deep purpose in helping your doubt move towards faith. And that deep and great purpose is moving you towards life and life to the fullest. And we see that at least in two places in this text. The so verse 29, he said, Blessed are those who have not seen me yet have believed. That word blessed is a very important word in the scriptures. It's a word that Jesus employed in his most famous, probably of all teachings, the Sermon on the Mount, in the Beatitudes, they're known as, when he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. 
for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who are meek, for they will inherit the earth. That sounds awesome. It's very inspirational. But are you serious, Jesus? Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Sounds kind of nice, but practically speaking, are you serious right now? That's, of course, the whole point of what Jesus is saying. When he used that word blessed, it's a Greek word, makarios. It just means to be, have complete and utter satisfaction, contentment, and joy regardless of circumstances. That's what it means to be blessed. And Jesus knows us well enough that in him and in him alone is this blessing regardless of circumstances. He knows that when we live for all the things we think, we feel we should have already, that best case scenario, those things are only ever fleeting. Or when things don't go well for us, because that's called the harshness and reality of life, this side of heaven, when things aren't going well for us, when circumstances aren't great, guess where we're led to in our own spirit? Into despair. And Jesus said, blessed are those who come to me for me, because in me and in me alone, I can give you this life, this blessing, this contentment, this, this joy. I love how uh, Danny and his baptism story, which you'll get to hear. I don't, I don't want to spoil it too much here. I'll just give the highlights. He highlights this thought of how before in Christ, he found a lot of love to be conditional out there. He said, but in Christ, I found that all, all love is, is unconditional. That's a profound statement. I got to, well... I want to pull out one more thought here because we, we need to see it. So there's, that's one place. Jesus says, blessed are those who uh, have not seen yet believe. And then he also says, much more clearly even, and this is John saying, and by believing in Christ as Messiah, as Lord, as God, you may have life in his name. And if you've been here through our series in the book of John, hopefully this is a bit of a review for you. But you know that in Greek there are two words for life. In English we just have one. And two words in Greek for life. One is bios, which is life in terms of existence. Okay, biology, right? That's not the word John is employing here. And then there's also the Greek word for zoe, which means life in terms of quality, which of course is what John is employ- employing here. This is, this, I mean, again, we have just one word for life in English. This is life as in this is living. Right? We're not referring to biology at that point. We're like, there's something, the quality of life. And Jesus said in John chapter 10, I have come that you would have life and life to the fullest. I have come to give you bread that will satisfy you, never hungry. I've come to give you water that you would never be thirsty again. I've come to give you life and life to the fullest. I got to have uh, coffee with a dear brother in Christ this week. He and his family have been coming for a number of, of weeks. It's been a real joy to have them in the church community, great people. And uh, he was just sharing a little bit of his story, how he uh, grew up in India, was raised Hindu, and was talking about how his life before Christ uh, had a lot of kind of deep-seated anxiety there. Because even the things that he was, he was attaining unto and accomplishing, it, also, it always came with like this anxiety of like, I gotta ma- maintain that, I gotta keep that, I gotta keep making sure that that's, that stays the way it is. And then he's like, and when things it weren't working well, well, that was just really hard because then it's like, oh, i got to write the ship and there's a lot of anxiety there. But he said, but when I came to put my faith in Jesus, I just found that all that anxiety went away because I have life in Jesus. He's like, I asked him, what do you mean? He's like, he's like well, just for instance, you know, things that I care about, like, you know, my job. Like, you know, before, I was always nervous, like, if my job left me, like, what would I do? Like, how would I? He's like, now? And he did a little hand wave. It was awesome. He's just like, now if I lose my job, it's like, I'm going to be bummed about it. I'm going to have to work it through. But I got Christ. Hope in him. It's all going to work out. He said, you know, in my relationships, people I love, it's like things don't work out quite well. It's like I'm going to work it through. God cares about those things. But I have Christ and hope in him. And I'm sitting there just like basking it all in because that's the promise that the Lord gives us. But guess what? All of us are often like Thomas in our doubts that God is going to truly actually be there in the way that we want him to, or at least in the way we figure he ought to be. And the form that that usually takes in us, that doubt, that confusion, is often, God, how could you not provide X, Y, or Z? But a little cheater notes for you guys, by way of application, I find this helpful in my life. Whatever I say, God, how could you not allow X, Y, or Z, or you're not giving X, Y, or Z, whatever X, Y, or Z are, tend to be the things that we're actually going to look for blessedness 
and life. But Jesus said, I alone can bless you apart from circumstances. I alone can give you a life that will fully satisfy and meet your greatest needs. And that's the call of the gospel of John. It's to believe. It's to trust. And when you struggle with that, to know that God loves you, cares for you, is not looking to beat you over the head with your doubt and confusion, but is wanting to know, what are you going to do with that doubt? Is it going to move you away from him? Or is it going to move you towards him? Because the promise is, with the stamp of resurrection on top of it, God will meet you in your doubt. He's not going anywhere. But will you remain? His desire is to move you from doubt increasingly into faith. And the one in whom loves you far greater than you could love yourself if, you were, if everything was up to you. So that you could have life and blessedness in him. So the questions are, do you believe him? Do you trust him? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this beautiful, powerful story here at the culmination of your, your gospel account as you had John record it. What a gift it is that we not only reach this peak of peaks, but we reach it through the story of doubt and confusion. What a statement you're making through your scripture, Lord. Thank you for loving us when our, when our hearts are filled with doubt and confusion. Forgive us when we know you're just so faithful, those of us who've been following you for a while. And would you help our doubt increasingly move us towards faith? And I want to pray, especially for those here today who are maybe wondering if they're Christian or trying to figure all these things out, that you'd make clear to them that it really comes down to what they in their hearts make of Jesus and what he did on the cross for them. Even as we celebrate that by way of baptism today, I pray that you'd help them even now, even right now in their hearts, make a decision to follow you, put their faith in you. But Father, help us be a church that wherever we are spiritually, we look to you. When we doubt, we have confusion, we look to you. And when we doubt and have confusion, we extend grace to one another as we look to you. We love you, Father. We pray this all in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our God. Amen.